and Nike. It was a good quarter. Uh, the company has clocked in close to about a 34% year-on-year revenue growth, though on a sequential basis, there has been some pressure. My colleague Mangalam caught up with Falguni Nair, executive chairperson, MD and CEO of the company, and began by asking her about the quarter gone by and how they see the fashion segment performing. If you look at a two-year basis, I think on the back of, uh, you know, COVID receding and many of the stores opening up, uh, we found that uh, the growth was uh, uh, growth was not uh, easy to come by. And like I guided yesterday in my uh, talk with the analysts, I think it's very important for us to that we, we grow the right categories, right brands, right mix at the right marketing costs. And I think that's what the focus is. I think overall on a full year basis, fashion has also grown uh, at 40% plus on the on, on the GMV basis. And I think that's a very healthy growth. Um, and uh, yes, I agree with you that it can accelerate, uh, accelerate as the fears of, um, you know, as the discretionary spending goes up. Right uh, categories, right prices, as well as uh, right marketing spends. I wanted to understand what right means because um, in the fourth quarter, you spent about 27% of your fashion GMB on marketing. Your contribution margin in fashion was just 2.6%. So if it grows at the 40% plus mark that you've been talking about, um, what is the operating leverage benefit here? What kind of contribution margin and steady state marketing spends are we looking at? Um, I, I, I keep saying that in an e-commerce business, uh, the marketing spend is a function of uh, new customer acquisition uh, versus repeat customer acquisition. And as the company go, grows in its journey for us, it's like third uh, important year for fashion, technically fourth year. But, you know, this, at scale, it's about three years of operation and customer acquisition. And as that equation improves, marketing cost always comes down. How do you uh, pursue growth in the beauty and personal care business? 30, 35 uh, percent, is that sustainable? And at the same time, we're looking at uh, contribution margins of the beauty business now stabilizing around 28 to 30 percent. Is that sustainable as well? I feel that beauty is in a very good place, both internationally and in India. I think internationally also beauty consumption is growing in India and uh, GCC are being recognized as two very important markets. To, uh, to for the for more diversification of growth, U.S. and China are the important markets. So I think India is becoming a relatively much more important market to global brands compared to what it has been in the past. So that is going to lead to a lot of excitement in the beauty industry, and we do believe that um, that should drive uh, additional growth in the coming year. You plan to double your offline presence. Uh, you have done that in the last year and you plan to increase that further as well. Just wanted to understand the rationale behind that. How do the unit economics of, uh, you know, selling offline benefit versus selling online? So firstly, I want to say that we're really happy that our uh, post-COVID, our, uh, our offline business is totally profitable. What I mean by totally profitable is not just a store EBITDA, it's a total business profitability, which covers all of the costs of the business, including depreciation and interest costs. So I think we're in a very happy place where our network is really in a, in a good place. And most of our stores are profitable. I would say 90, 95% of the store, stores are profitable at the, uh, you know, store level. So I think in many ways, uh, I all I can say is that I think we have a great network. I think we grew it very in an accelerated manner post-COVID. Our whole logic was that we need to have that one destination store in most cities and in bigger city like Bombay, ba Delhi and Bangalore, it's more because there are so many catchments. So I think what we are going to do is we're going to continue with the destination store strategy. We are in 65 cities. We've said we'll go to 100. I think in the coming year, we'll do about 50 stores on back of 150 that we already have. So the pace of growth is, uh, uh, you know, is going to uh, taper down compared to the past where there was accelerated growth following COVID. So we are, we are, we like, we like our strategy, which is more measured strategy for physical retail. I have to admit that e-commerce is definitely a far more profitable channel than physical retail. Falguni, from a stock market standpoint, you know, the street isn't very happy with uh, a bunch of things and which is reflected in the kind of underperformance that we've seen in Nike as well. The stock virtually close to its 52-week low from one year ago. It's halved. Uh, the street has a bunch of concerns. One was with regards to the entire kerfuffle that happened during the bonus issue. The second one, was, of course, is, uh, you know, the valuations in the new age business itself. The third one is competition coming in from larger established players as well. Which of these concerns do you think are, uh, you know, legit? And what are you doing to assuage investor concerns? I mean, there have been some serious uh, senior exits as well from the company. 
I think, uh, you know, it is a lot of uh, media highlighting uh, things which in our mind are not issues, non-issues. So I can just say that uh, the bonus issue is always considered, uh, it's it's a very fair issuance, which is uh, available. I mean, it's being it's benefiting all of the shareholders of the company. I think uh, in terms of voting, 91% of the shareholders had voted and all of them had 100% voted in favor. So we had not seen any issues. We've also seen that many bonus was not going to affect any of the new shareholders at all because uh, their shares were not locked in. If there was uh, any delay in terms of those shares being available to trade, it would affect the pre-IPO shareholders and most of them have been able to get exit. So I think most of our underperformance, you can say, can be attributed to uh, post lockup or large cap table changing hands. And I think we have been monitoring that. Our uh, retail shareholder base has, in fact, gone up from less than 1% of the company to 4% of the company. Our uh, institutional base, both from mutual fund as well as FIs, has been constantly going up in a post-bonus environment. So I think it, it, I don't think there is no indication of data or facts that shows that bonus issue was not right for the investors in the company as well as for the company. So that's one. As far as the competition is concerned, I think for large complex businesses like ours, uh, with more than 15 million, uh, you know, TTM annual transacting users, uh, with <clears throat> stores in 150 cities, with <clears throat> 3,500 brands on our pla platform, and many of them exclusive, and many of them, even if they are not exclusive, it's not that they are widely distributed. Um, and, and there is a need, like, I think for overnight, anyone to hurt our business doesn't happen. So I think a lot of competition concerns seem uh, you know, seem uh, they don't seem valid from a financial uh, effect on our business perspective. And we also have to, I mean, obviously, when I do remember that when, when I entered the business in 2012, soon after in 2013, Amazon had entered the market and everyone kept saying, how will you Amazon proof our business? So I think the challenges for management are more about how do they take their business forward in a way that they have the consumer connect and that that's where our success lies. As far as these... Uh, exits of employees were concerned, I think, again, they were a little bit non-event. I think it came on the back of past practice of we being a small company with very high designation compared to sometimes the roles that are being played by those individuals. And I have gone on record post that to say we have more than 50 such senior executives, of which maybe five may have left. So I think from that perspective, and I, in fact, made an effort to give names of all of our senior leaders, you know, whether be it in technology, be it in finance, be it in marketing, we also showed the depth of our management. I think uh, company is in a very good place. The only thing that I would like to then ask is that at current levels, would the promoters perhaps show some intent and buy from the open market and give the signal to the stock markets? I think, you know, uh, the point is that uh, we are professional turn entrepreneurs. So uh, let's put it this way, that uh, the fact that a lot of uh, promoters are committing their lives uh, early, like uh, both Anshit and Advaita are very young at 33 years of age. They've been working for the company for six to 10 years. They're really committed in making their career with this company. And uh, so am I, I'm very committed to this company. I think that itself should be considered as, uh, you know, as uh, backing enough. I, I don't want to opine on, on, uh, on, the, on the stock prices. And I think it would be a wrong thing to comment on that. But I think overall, uh, we are always behind the company and behind the the stock. All right. Well, time to slip into a short break then. On the other side, we'll connect with Pavitra Shankar, the MD of Brigade Enterprises. Stay with us.